want to introduce to you this morning just something that we're going to explore the next three weeks of upwards, inwards, and outwards. And I'm sure that in the room, there are a number of people who have come up with some New Year's resolutions. Do we have anybody who wants to be bold and declare that they've done that? No. Okay. Maybe one of them should be. I must be bolder to declare that I've made some resolutions. Well, I just know across the city, there will be a higher level of uh, members signing up at gyms. There will be diet associations and clubs that will have an influx of new uh, join-ups uh, over the next week or so. There'll be people uh, buying trainers to run up and down the side of the river. There will be all sorts of activities that people will be engaging with in the next few weeks as a desire to come into this with some new intention. And of course, the new year is a good opportunity to do just that. But Christmas and New Year, um, I, I'm sure you've done something that's similar to something that I've done a few times over the last few weeks. It's a good time to play board games, isn't it? Have you played a board game? You know, we've, we've had a few new games introduced into our home this Christmas. We've got one that's got a ticking bomb, and uh, you have to choose card and it's got letters and you have to think of words with those, le with those letters involved in the words and if you don't think of something you have to keep hold of the bomb and you don't want to be holding the bomb when it goes off because it just makes a bit of a noise and it's a little bit of anticlimax but it's, a, it's an interesting new game. We, we played true or false around someone's home uh, the other day but there's one board game that I've not played this Christmas but I've played many times in the past and I'm sure you understand what I mean when I say this. Snakes and Ladders. You familiar with the game of Snakes and Ladders? You've got a board that's chopped up into squares, and you've got all the numbers in the squares, maybe one to a hundred, and you roll a dice, you roll a three, you move your counter three spaces forward, and the idea is to get a hundred. It's the first one to get a hundred is the winner of the game. But there's some hazards and there's some joys on the journey. There are snakes. You don't want to land on the head of a snake. Because what happens when you land on the head of a snake is that you slide all the way down that slippery sucker right to the tail of a snake and you go backwards on the board. And none of us want to go on the snakes because the snakes are horrible. They're a the pantomime villain. They are not the one that we want to engage with. So we're desperately trying to... You know, there's that moment you roll the dice and, and before you actually count it out on the board, you're sort of counting out in your head and thinking, please not a snake, please not a snake, please not a snake. But then... There are some things that you look to land on on the board. Ladders. And you want to land at the bottom of a ladder because when you land at the bottom of a ladder, you can climb up the rungs of that ladder. It is like an elevator to another level. You want to go on those ladders and you want to scale those things because maybe you can avoid 20 to 30 mo um, character moves and get well, well ahead. And, I, and I've just on social media over the last few days, I've seen some people um, in ministry declare some ladders. You know, I've seen them, oh, this is going to be an unprecedented year of favor and acceleration and growth. We're going to move forward. You're going to hit higher. You're going to break through greater. And it's like, give me the ladder. And there's not many people online saying, oh, this is going to be a slippery year. This is going to be a tough time. You're going down the snake. You're going to go backwards. Not many of those prophecies and I'm glad that there are not many of those prophecies. But I want to ask the question today, do those ladders exist in our faith? Are those ladders real or are those ladders fictitious? Are those ladders made up by the optimistic proclamation of preachers who want to tickle the ears of their congregations? Or are they real? Yeah. And I want to explore something together with you today. Because if they're real, let's get at the bottom of them. But if they're not, let's keep on rolling the dice and going to where we're going. Yeah. Let's turn together to the book of Joshua. Phenomenal story. We pick up Joshua 1. This is just after Moses, the great leader, has died. And the... Apprentice takes on 
the mantle and responsibility. Fairly intimidating task to step into someone else's shoes. And this is Joshua's moment. And God is affirming Joshua of a few things. It's a new moment in the life of the nation. Moses had been prohibited from entering into the place of promise because he had made some mistakes. And now was Joshua going to be the one to take us to that place? And God has an interaction with Joshua. And we pick this up, Joshua chapter 1, verse 1 to 6. It says this, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. So this is an incredible moment. Joshua, hearing the Lord say, I am about to take you into this place that for generations you have desired to go. That film that's out in the cinema at the moment that sort of rides on the back of a Bible story, but it's not really a Bible story, the one of Moses, that all the reviews I see don't really sort of articulate it as something that's going to particularly resonate with some of the things of the Scriptures. But right from that Exodus moment, right to this moment, these, this nation had been desirous about entering into this place of promise. There was a place that they desired to be and to live and to possess. And now God was saying to Joshua, you're going to lead them to this place. But there were some things they had to do to get there. I don't know how many of you... Um, find yourself in a situation where you're using your computer and then it comes up with a message that says you can't do this unless you download something. You need to update your Adobe. You need to update your Flash. You need to do something. You need to install some other device and some other software enabling you to do what you want to do. So you click on the button and you just hope it's, that's all it's going to be. But then it comes up with a sign, with a form that says, what's your email address? So you think, I don't want to give them my email address. I just, wanna, I just want the app. I just want the software. Uh, but it won't let you progress until you do the, the sign up, until you put your email address in. And then that little next tab at the bottom goes darker and you can click on it and go to the next page. Think, great, I'm going to get there. But then it starts asking for your address. And you think, how little can I get away with completing here in order to be able to progress to the next level? And so you might try just putting your postcode in and click next, but it's not having any of it. So you put in your first line, and it comes up, these two boxes are still empty. You need to complete them. So you fill in the full details. And then the next goes dark, and you click on it, and then you're into the next, what you hope is going to be the software. But no, 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 no. They now want to promote some things to you. And you're not really interested in them, but they, they insist that you read through and they insist that you untick boxes that are pre-ticked for you because they just assume you're going to be interested. But you just know you're going to get bombarded with sales emails as a result. So you go through and tick the box and you're just thinking, all I wanted to do was to play with that bit of software that demanded I install this and now I feel like I've written a dissertation to get there. I find that really frustrating, that there are steps I seem to be required to go through. But you see this, you can't progress until you've completed the page that you're on. And God was promising Joshua that they will enter the land. But what he says is this, everywhere you put your feet, I will give you. Everywhere you step. Now, I have visions of, 
you know, wandering around and saying, got it, got it, got it, yes, mine, 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 mine. You know, let's just run around the room, let's claim everything, let's do a, let's do a prayer run around Exeter, let's claim the land for Jesus, it's mine, 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 mine. But you see, what often happens is that we're not interested in the footsteps, we're just interested in the land of promise. We're just interested in entering into that place of fulfillment that God has for us. And the footsteps, they don't become part of our journey and consequence. They just are things we have to do. They're boxes we have to tick in order to get there. But God said to Joshua, your footsteps are important. Where you place your feet is incredibly important. Because this is going to blow you away. If you don't step here, you won't step there. That's deep. Let me illustrate it another way. If you don't step here, you won't step there. Am I losing you? Because that's quite profound. That is really deep stuff. You can't take the next pace until you've taken the last one. But God is not just saying, this is not just about land. This is about redemption. This is about claiming. This is about inheritance. This is about redeeming something under your feet. This is about the significance of what sits under your size 10 shoes. This is about you claiming the land of where you're standing, not just where you're going. This is about inviting God to help you to have an inheritance in where you are, not just where you're going. Because so often in our Christian faith, we're living for that next day, that great move of God, that great outpouring of His presence. We're longing for that next experience and all the time we're in one. Grew up in the valleys of South Wales, where the valleys are full of memorials of past moves of God. Buildings that once were overflowing with people singing the praises of God. Converted miners that their ponies no longer could understand them underground because they didn't use swear language any longer. And the ponies refused to work because they only understood obscenities. Where law courts had no cases to judge because there was such a conversion. Where the pubs closed down because this drinking culture decided this is not good for us. And so they had to start soft drink manufacturers in order to give people something to drink. And you go around the valleys of Wales and there are memorials of all these things that have happened. There are buildings that are now garages or converted into housing, flats, or selling carpets. And at the front, they look like churches, but inside, they they no longer function with that sense of God's doing something great. But growing up in that environment, we kept getting reminded of what happened in the past. And we kept getting told, it's going to happen in the future. Come on, the promised land. Once again, the valleys will ring with the praises of God. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. We used to be reminded that revival was just around the corner. And it was a really long corner. And we're still traveling around the corner, waiting for this phenomenal move of something. Maybe 2015 will be that year. Oh, maybe this is the time to move into the promised land. And we forget the footsteps. Where we are now. What we're doing now. We place all of our hopes, all of our expectations in something that has not yet happened. And we ignore that which is happening now. That place we stand now. That place we're called to now. The promise that God has given us now. God said to Joshua, wherever you place your feet, I will give you that land. 
You see, I believe that there is a transformation transaction that takes place under the place that we stand if we invite God. See, when I, just over a year ago, just under a year ago actually, almost a few days away, we exchanged contracts on a house in Exeter. We moved, we relocated, we packed the vans, and there was a moment when I was stood in the estate agents waiting for a phone call from the various solicitors to say the deeds had been exchanged, the money has been transferred, and these keys are now officially yours. There was a transaction that needed to happen in order for that to become my possession. And I believe that God was saying to Joshua, there is a transformational transaction that is going to take place under your feet. This is not just about you putting footprints down and saying, they're my shoes, that's my print. But there was a transformational transaction that took place that said, this land once belonged to an enemy, and now this land belongs to the Lord. And there's a transformational transaction that takes place in each of our lives, in the place that we stand. Redeeming our footprints. Redeeming those things that we currently stand in. Because we live in a world that is very desirous of the grass in the next field. Something I've discovered over the years is the grass in the next field still needs mowing. In our own lives, that the place that we are, the place that we stand, is the place that God wants us to enter into that transformational transaction of knowing his provision and his goodness and knowing his power present in the place that we stand. You see, I don't believe you'll get to the place where God's taken you unless you have allowed God to transform a transaction in the place that you're standing. I don't believe God will take the church here into a place of revival until we've been full stewards of the place that we're standing now. The theme of upward, inward, and outward in the place that we stand. Where do you stand? What about your marriage? What's going on in your marriage? Is, there a, is the, the marriage that you step into, the relationships, your friendships, is the, has there been a transformational transaction that's taken place where you've invited God? Have, have you claimed, you say, oh, it's too challenging, too difficult, and God is saying, I want to come into that place that you stand. I want to give you the marriage that I've called you to have in the place that you stand. Stop thinking in a year's time things will be different. It's now where you're standing. So if I only had a different job, if only I was with a new employer, things would be different. And God's saying, the place that you're standing now is the place where there should be a transaction taking place where God gives you that space, that moment, that time, that location that you're in. Because I've discovered that there have been numerous times in my life when I've said, if I had something else, my life would be different. I remember saying, if I live near a park... I will go jogging regularly. <laughs> and God humors you, doesn't he? And we had, a, we had a home near a park. And I think I went once. Because it was hard work. I realized that the reason I wasn't jogging wasn't because I didn't live near a park. The reason I wasn't jogging was because it was hard work and I didn't like it. I remember once saying, if I only had a cycle, I will ride back and forth to work. Do you know I had visions, such romantic visions of cycling to work. I had this beautiful picture of the sun shining, the birds singing in the air, you know, people smiling as you drove past guys lifting off their hat to you, <laughs> little bunny rabbits on the side of the road waving. You know, and I had this vision that this was going to be so wonderful. And I'd get to work and think, oh, it's been so good to do some exercise and get you today. So I bought a bike. And I pulled out of the little cul-de-sac where we lived, 
and I made my way onto the main road, and this big juggernaut rattled past me, my bike shook, my knees quaked, and I thought, I'm going to die. <laughs> there were no rabbits, there was no sunshine, just rain, just rain, that's all there was. And I got to work, and I needed trauma counseling at the end of the day. You know, I, I, my first thought when I got to the office was, I need a shower. This is just awful. I can't see people like this throughout the day. And I did it once. The reason I didn't cycle to work wasn't because I didn't have a bike. It was because I'm a wuss on the roads. And I didn't want to do it. And I so often find people, they say, when something changes... I will change. I remember when I was a teenager, I said, if I had a desk in my bedroom, I would study. <laughs> That's the only thing standing between me and masterly education is a desk. So I got a desk. And I studied for a few days. And then I worked out that the reason I wasn't studying wasn't because I didn't have a desk. It was because I didn't like it. And yet I find this pattern repeated in our lives. That when I get there, my life will be different. When I get to the promised land, I will be spiritual. When I go to Bible college, I'll start praying. When I get involved in a leadership position in the church, that's when I'll get serious for God. And we create these conditions that say, if only I was in a different footstep, a different position, then I will be different. But the reality is this. God has called you to the place you stand in. And He wants to give you a transformational transaction in that place. He wants you to redeem and to claim that place that you're standing in. And you say, you don't know my boss, he's a tyrant. You're right, I don't know him or her. But I do know that God has given you the ability to be an overcomer in that situation. I do know that God is able to give you wisdom in that situation. I do believe that God is able to give you courage at that time. See, I, I think if we don't inhabit the places we walk, the places we walk inhibit us. We either inhabit or they inhibit. We inhabit them by inviting God to come and bring his transaction. They inhibit us by us resenting the moment we're in and dreaming of better days. This is not a year for us to dream some crazy dream that says, oh, one day we'll get to the promised land and it will be great and let's pray it's this year. This is a year for us to claim the land that's under our feet. This is a year for us to stand with courage and boldness in the things that God has called you to. The church is not just a gathering of people on a Sunday. The church is a scattering of people into the community, into society. It's those neighborhoods that God has put, placed you to stand. It's that family that God has placed you within to stand. It's that employment situation, that university position that God has called you to stand. And he has given you everything you need to claim it for the Lord. You inhabit it or inhibits you. Joshua is told by the Lord in verse 6, be strong and courageous. What a strange thing to say to someone. Be strong. Come on, be strong. Be strong. Like, you'd normally sort of make an assumption that you shake their hand and you think they're strong. Or you shake their hand and think they're not very strong. You know, it's normally a statement of how you find someone. You know, there are some people in this church, I shake your hand and I need prayer afterwards. You know, you've got such a grip. And it's like, ah, praise God. Ow. 
Be strong. What does it mean? Be strong. How can you just feel weak and then be strong? How does that happen? How can you just be courageous? There's nothing worse than being in a, a needy situation and having someone say to you, pull yourself together. There's nothing worse than feeling vulnerable and weak and someone says, just toughen up. It's like, what does it mean? How, how do I do that? How can I be strong? I feel vulnerable. I feel disappointed where I'm standing. I'm, I look forward to that promised land, but where I am right now is a bit disappointing. What do you mean, be strong? And there are a number of reasons why God tells us to be strong. You see, strength has a source. It comes from somewhere. Some of those handshakes I have with people in the church, your strength comes from some of those muscles that exist within your arms and within your hands. There's a source where that strength comes from. Source has a strength. And I find that in my life, when I've invited God into the place I stand, that I know strength. And I've found that there are often times that I can be so easily distracted from the things that allow that strength to be prevalent in my circumstance. I'm sure no one else here struggles with distraction. I do. Do you get easily distracted? This morning I got up early, I go to my office at home, and um, just to pray and go over things for this morning, just try and seek God. And, and, and I think I'm going to put some music on in the background of my office. I go to my computer and I just go into my music app and I just play some music. And then it comes up with this little thing that says, you need to update your, your music application software. So I just think, oh, I'll just click on that. Um, it'll do that in the background while it's playing the music. Um, and then this virus warning thing came up that um, said your virus software is out of date. And, um, you know, do you want to renew it? And think, well, I'll just quickly renew that. And um, then it came up with this screen that began to check through the registry files of the computer and began to look at um, all the, the, the fragmenting of the hard drive and began to tell me I had about 800 fragmented sections of my hard drive. Do I want to repair that? And, you know, before I realize it, this time of prayer and seeking the Lord is actually I'm an IT expert. <laughs> and... And I've been distracted. I'm a little bit, you know, like my dog that I take out for walks. And, you know, she's really a good dog. She's obedient. And she just, you know, she's very, very good. But she doesn't really go out for walks. She goes out for sniffs. She just gets a scent. And she loses all sense of obedience when she gets a scent. So I could be holding her on the lead and we're walking around where, near where I live and it's all very calm and she gets a smell and then suddenly I'm pulled in a completely different direction because she's onto something. And, she, and suddenly she just stops. There's nothing you can see. The only assumption you can make is another dog has weed at that spot at some point previously. And she finds it fascinating. She's thinking, Ma, I met that dog once. Just... You know, there is no destination to this thing. What are you doing? What on earth are you doing? Come on. It's raining. I'm getting wet here. Just do your business and let's get back in the house. She sort of looks at me. Goes, well, that was interesting. And we walk on a little bit further and she's obedient. And then she gets a scent and suddenly I'm off in another direction again. She's like Nita with shops. You know, we walk through the city center. And it's like we're going somewhere and she just begins to get drawn in by the magnet. And we get so easily distracted. And I know there are people here this morning who say, oh, this year my resolution is to give God everything. He's going to have my whole life. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. Oh, that's interesting. And we get so easily distracted. And sometimes our dreams and our visions of the future distract us. Now I'm, I'm all for a big narrative and I'm all for a vision. And I believe God has some amazing things in store for us this year. I really do. I'm so excited about 2015. And what I believe God's going to do among us. But 
I don't want to lose sight of where I'm standing right now, the moment that I'm in, the place I stand, the place that my feet step on. God, in all of my circumstance, in all of my situation, I want to give this to you. We need to unblock the channels of our source of strength. Don't be distracted. Don't take a spiritual sabbatical in your life. And just in conclusion, some simple reasons why we can know God is our strength. Verse 3, it says, I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. God never forgets his promises. Moses had died and God remembered I wonder what promises sit over your life. God hasn't forgotten. Oh, he hasn't forgotten. And maybe you've been looking to the future and say, one day I'll get there. And it might be the moment you're in. It might be the place that you're at. It might be because you've not invited God's transformational transaction into the place that you are that you've not moved forward to the place where you could be. Because if you've not given God 100% and stewarded this well, maybe you're not ready for the next place. Maybe you feel stuck because you've not learned the lessons where you are. Maybe you've not experienced that big breakthrough because there are some things that you constantly avoid in your present. But God never forgets his promises. Verse 5, it says, no one will be able to stand against you. Do you know, wouldn't it be amazing if this year, I don't mean with a combative spirit that just says, who do you think you are talking to me like that? But I mean, in whatever situation you're in, that you can stand with confidence and courage knowing that if God is for you, who can be against you? You know, when your boss rants at you, your lecturer marks you down, and you, know, you feel a sense of injustice, but you know, it doesn't, doesn't mean you have to fight the space. Just you think, God is for me. I can relax in this. See, because the enemy is really good at pulling us down and distracting us. He's got an ability to try and ebb away our confidence in our lives. And sometimes they're big moments, and sometimes they're just annoying of continuation of issues. And no one can stand against our God. And in your moment, it might be you have to redeem an understanding of that truth in your circumstance into your need, into your situation, and say, no one can stand against my God. Verse 5 says, as I, was with Moses, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you, and I will never forsake you. This is a year where I absolutely guarantee you that God is faithful. He never leaves us. We're faithless. I get, I get staggered when I read some of the Old Testament stories. I think of that moment when I see Moses getting the commandments up on the mountainside and, the, and there was a, you know, a cloud enveloping the mountain and they would have heard the noise of the voice of the Lord. And they'd just been rescued from Egypt. They'd seen the Egyptians swallowed up in the Red Sea where they'd walk through on dry ground. And by the time Moses comes down the mountain, they've built a, a golden calf. They've been distracted. They've almost flown in the face of everything that God had been to them. And then I see the propensity that each of us have in our lives to leave a place of worship like this 
and say, oh God, I'm going to give you my moment. I'm going to give you my steps. I'm going to give you my day. I'm going to give you my circumstance. I'm going to claim where I'm standing for you. And then we go and something else comes along and we get distracted and we get pulled off course. Scripture says the heart is desperately wicked and deceitful. We've got to keep a watch of that in our hearts because that's where sin emanates from. It starts in the heart. It starts from a deception. It starts from a discontent. It starts from a sense of corruption within the heart. And I know that you can be confident, bold, and strong in God because he's with you. Because he fulfills and remembers his promises. And because if God is with you, who can be against you?